everyone and welcome. I'm Marina Hatsopoulos from Hellenic Innovation Network, which hosts these webcasts with the support of MIT Enterprise Forum Greece and the Consulate of Greece in Boston. And our goal is to help build a bridge between the United States and the Greek startup community. Uh, I had the good fortune of meeting two of our entrepreneurs today. Several years ago, I met uh, George from Augmenta and Sotiris from Centaur um, early in their startups. And more recently, I met with Fotis. And um, I was so impressed with all of them. Agriculture has a long tradition in Greece. And those of us who spend a lot of time in Greece appreciate the product, the very high quality of the produce there. In recent years, there's been a push to sustainability and also a drive in technology toward artificial intelligence and machine learning. So I'm looking forward to seeing this event and learning how technology has an impact, not just on profitability and productivity, but also on sustainability. During the event, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to put them into the Zoom chat. Or if you have ideas for future um, events that we can uh, put on, please put those into the chat or reach out to me uh, directly. You can check us out at hellenic.org where you can find news and events about the Greek startup ecosystem. And uh, you can also register and become part of our community. I'd like to introduce Stratos Eftimiou, who's the Consul General of Greece in Boston. Stratos. Thank you, Marina. It is uh, my great uh, pleasure and honor to uh, introduce Mr. Christos Dimas, Deputy Minister of Development and Investments, Research, Innovation and Technology. It is a, a great timing, as only last Monday, Microsoft President Brad Smith announced Microsoft's plans to uh, build a data uh, hub in Athens. Uh, Minister Dimas, uh, spearheaded a series of actions to promote entrepreneurship in Greece, including uh, tax incentives and the project Elevate Greece, and uh, also initiatives aiming to support innovation and uh, Greece's startups. Uh, before the uh, breakout of the pandemic, uh, he had accepted our invitation uh, to participate in person uh, to uh, an MIT uh, Media Lab event of the Hellenic Innovation uh, Network, and I'm uh, and I hope that we will uh, manage to uh, invite him uh, sooner than later to our next in-person uh, event. I would like to thank him for supporting the Hellenic Innovation Network uh, activities and for his participation. Uh, I would like also to remind to our. Uh, Yes, that he's an MP from Corinth, a region famous for its resins and its uh, agricultural uh, uh, tradition and production. Uh, Mr. Minister, welcome. We are always at your uh, disposal in your attempts to reach out to the distinguished academic and research community in New uh, England. Hello, first of all, thank you very much for uh, organizing, hosting and inviting me here. It's, it's a great honor and pleasure to, to be with you and uh, talk about research and innovation in Greece and uh, linking it with uh, agricultural production. We, we all know that Greece does produce indeed excellent products, uh, quality products, and we export many of them uh, all around the world. But the reality is that we can uh, we can actually uh, uh, produce even more products if we take advantage of uh, research and, and innovation. So I would like to, to start sharing my screen uh, for, my, for my presentation. One, one minute. Okay. Um, can you see my presentation? I, I assume that you can. Um, first of all, um, we, we don't claim to know everything. So we did, we did need to have a, a steering committee of, uh, of experts in the field of uh, research and, and innovation. So in the, in the beginning of, uh, of this government's term, we did create the National Council for Research, Technology and Innovation. And in fact, we have Professor Spiros Artavanis Tsakonas, who you might know from, uh, from uh, Boston in the US. 
is, is actually leading the National Council for Research, Technology and Innovation, and we're very proud of that. So in, within a year, ESETEC, uh, the National Council for Research, Technology and Innovation, has contributed uh, in order to create the National Startup Registry, Elevate Greece, which well, I, I will explain uh, a bit later on. Uh, we have uh, improved the institutional framework for spin-offs uh, of universities and research centers. We are establishing the operation, operational technology transfer offices. Uh, it, uh, we have uh, uh, completed structural reforms which give more flexibility uh, to the research centers. We uh, uh, established uh, uh, an additional flagship ac action uh, related to COVID-19. Uh, and um, we have uh, proposed the uh, uh, composition of the electorate. Uh, there is a government scheme for the preparation of the new partnership agreement, which are the ESPA funds, that is uh, the European Cohesion Funds. And uh, we have actually established sectoral scientific councils. So uh, um, according to, to sectors, we have uh, uh, more experts helping us and advising us uh, in our policy actions. But of course, apart from the experts, you do need funds. So we have created the, the Equi Fund, which uh, has uh, 112 million euros in, in total. It includes more than 150 investors. Uh, many startups uh, have been funded in, in various sectors. And it's, uh, it's important to, to know that one euro of investment from Equi Fund corresponds to about 3.7 total investments in companies. So I, I did mention Elevate Greece previously, uh, and I would like to explain what Elevate Greece exactly does. We, we started uh, wanting to implement policies that would be beneficial for startups uh, and spin-offs in, in the country. One of the problems that we faced is that even if we legislated specific uh, um, incentives uh, for our startup ecosystem, in reality, we didn't know to whom we, we, are, we, we were speaking to because there wasn't a registry and there isn't a, 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 an acceptable by all definition of uh, what companies uh, consist uh, startups. So we started looking at best practices of other countries and we saw that some other countries had uh, created a, a national startup registry. This will help us map the Greek startup ecosystem. We will be able to monitor progress through specific KPIs. It will help networking uh, between the ecosystem. We will be addressing local and global investors. Elevate Greece will be in English. And it will allow the state to create tailor-made measures uh, such as financial aid or tax exemptions. So it's, it's an important step for us. Uh, apart from the, the startups, uh, it will include uh, all of the incubator, incubator centers, the accelerators in, in the country, the venture capital funds. So we're trying to uh, organize much more effectively the, the Greek ecosystem, which uh, in my view has a lot to, to offer. And uh, so investors uh, outside Greece will be able to have a peak uh, to the Greek ecosystem, but at the same time, uh, startups in Greece will be able to uh, take advantage of, uh, of the tailor-made measures by the state uh, or even uh, help create clusters between them. So uh, it's, it's an important initiative which we are actually uh, presenting with the Prime Minister uh, this Tuesday. Uh, so we will have the, the launch campaign then. Uh, apart from Elevate Greece, for the first time the Greek state uh, did legislate specific tax incentives for business angels. So 50% of the investment uh, will be deductible from taxable income uh, investments, of course, in startups that are registered on uh, the Elevate Greece website. This is an important first step for us. Uh, we are considering uh, additional incentives for business angels as well. Uh, this is just a, a uh, a non-exhaustive list of uh, the most funded Greek startups and successful exits over the last years. And I'm sure that you will know many of these companies. Uh, most of them have uh, uh, important uh, um, uh, 
experience outside the country as well. Um, we wanted though to see how we can give a, an important boost to research and innovation within the country and at the same time make, uh, make the country much more attractive for investments in, uh, in R&D. So one uh, very important decision that we made was to uh, increase the, the, the rate, the tax rate in super deductions. It used to be at 30%. And we increased it uh, to 100% uh, of super deduction rates for companies investing in, in R&D. Uh, according to the, uh, uh, to the studies that we have implemented, we expect that this measure will, will help boost investments in R&D uh, uh, exceeding 300 million in the next three years. So if we want to start uh, being attractive uh, for R&D companies to come establish themselves in Greece or give more incentives to companies that do invest in R&D within Greece, uh, we have to give them important uh, incentives. And this is a very important incentive, which we believe will open uh, new job opportunities for scientists in the country. Uh, at the same time, we have been very active in uh, transnational cooperation agreements in research technology uh, and innovation and we are uh, continuously increasing these uh, agreements. In fact, uh, in the previous week, we did sign a uh, science and technology agreement with the United States. Um, it's, it's quite interesting because when I became Deputy Minister of uh, Research and Innovation, I, I realized that Greece had bilateral agreements with other countries, but we didn't have a bilateral agreement with the United States. Uh, so when the strategic dialogue between Greece and the U.S. started last November in Athens, I did put that on the table. And uh, uh, when I did travel to Washington, D.C. Uh, last winter, I had a meeting with uh, the chief technology officer of the White House, uh, Mr. Michael Kratzios. Uh, and I did go to, to Maryland uh, to visit the National Science Foundation, where we immediately agreed that we wanted to sign a technology agreement, science and technology agreement between the two countries. We would have signed it uh, in March, so it would have been uh, extremely fast uh, for the procedures of, uh, of the two countries. Uh, and uh, we were to sign it in Athens uh, because there was a mission of, uh, of companies and scientists that would visit Athens at that period. But unfortunately, due to COVID-19, uh, this did not happen. Uh, the agreement practically uh, builds uh, a legal framework, a uh, much more effective framework uh, that will allow uh, more uh, bridges between the countries in the field of science and technology. Uh, allow me to say that one of the most important uh, initiatives of the Ministry of Development and Investments has to do with the creation of an innovation district in Athens. What is an innovation district? An innovation district is a, practically a physical ground of, uh, of innovation where you have uh, entrepreneurs uh, or companies uh, that, that have part of their R&D departments established there. You have the startup community, universities, researchers uh, who try to create synergies between them in order to produce uh, innovative products, services, or even processes. So this, this is proceeding uh, very quickly through, through a public-private partnership, and we believe it will, be, it will become the natural physical ground of innovation, uh, not only of uh, Athens and Greece, but of Southeastern Europe. Um, we also have a very important project in, uh, in Thessaloniki, where we are creating the Thessaloniki International Technology Center. And the project here is a bit different. Uh, apart from how we don't, we don't uh, have uh, parts of uh, the R&D department of companies, but we, all, we actually have all of the research center of companies. And around that, we're trying to build the uh, innovation uh, uh, ecosystem there. Um, both projects have attracted a lot of interest uh, from uh, extremely important companies, not only based in Greece, but international companies. So we believe that these two projects will put Greece in the innovation uh, uh, map uh, of, uh, of Europe and not only. Finally, uh, we do believe that innovation should, should go horizontally to all of the uh, 
sectors of the economy. We recently announced an important initiative with uh, the National Defense Ministry and the Civil Protection Ministry as well. Uh, and of course with agricultural. And I would like to specifically point out to five initiatives trying to link in scientific research with the agricultural production more uh, effectively. So we do have three flagship actions, uh, the creation of national research networks, uh, which practically means that scientists and researchers from different uh, academic institutions um, uh, come together uh, in order to, to see uh, how they can produce uh, uh, better and more innovative projects. So one of these flagship actions has to do with, uh, with honey, the other with the uh, vineyard, and the third with uh, olive oil. Uh, then we have a flagship action in the field of agri-food uh, of the region of, uh, of Crete. Crete, as you know, is, uh, is one of the uh, most important uh, uh, agricultural areas uh, of the country. Uh, then we are, uh, we are monitoring 185 integrated projects for agri-food uh, in the action uh, of research, create, uh, innovate. Uh, this is through the cohesion funds. Um, we have seven funding applications for innovation clusters on agri-food with a budget of 1.4 million euros. And there's an annual certification of R&D expenses by companies and the agri-food sector. In 2017, we had six requests. This number is growing as the years pass by. And we hope, uh, and that is uh, our intention, that uh, we will be able to extend our projects in, uh, in uh, linking research with agricultural production. Because uh, if we want to have, we know that we have uh, quality products in the country, but we have to be more competitive uh, in all of the all of the chain with countries that can produce more products in uh, in uh, less uh, uh, in less square meters so we're working on that and uh, we do have uh, uh, the scientific community a part of the scientific community working on it and uh, we believe that within the next uh, uh, couple of years we will have even more uh, innovative projects in agriculture thank you very much uh, that was it. Uh, thank you, Minister Dimas. Very interesting presentation. Uh, I hope we will be able to take advantage of all these opportunities for the next few years to build up the community there. So before handing it over to our moderator, Apostolos Klontes, let me say a few things about him. Apostolos is a growth-minded executive. Uh, he's the senior principal in Flagship Ventures. He has uh, which is a very reputable fund in Boston, as many of you know. Um, he has been the general manager of Bayer uh, in Greece, and he has an extensive um, uh, experience in, in business uh, with uh, uh, combined uh, academic, science, and financial backgrounds. Uh, Apostolos, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks. It's an honor to participate in this uh, webinar today. And it's a pleasure to have all these uh, speakers and participants. Um, I would like to start with um, um, a brief um, introduction. Um, and um, this brief introduction will start with uh, the three participants. Um, but uh, overall, um, I would like to state that um, we will try here to um, address uh, one or two questions for each of the participants. Um, we will allow for approximately 10 minutes for each of the participants. And after that, we will allow for one specific question to follow up from uh, uh, the answers of each of the speakers. And then um, we will have um, approximately 15 to 20 minutes at the end for general questions and discussion. So without any further ado, um, I would like to start um, uh, with introduction by inviting um, um, uh, George Varvarelis uh, from Ungmenta. George? Hello, Apostole. Thank, thank you. Thank you all for having me. So, George, tell us uh, a little bit about yourself, uh, about your company, um, so that we can then jump into the specific topic. Of course. So, so I, I'm, I'm George. I'm, uh, I'm an ex-farmer. Uh, I'm an engineer. I'm the, the founder and CEO of Augmenta. 
Um, Augmenta is, is, is automating the most uh, financially impactful operations of, of a farm, like uh, fertilization or, or pesticide spraying, through a retrofit uh, camera-based system that is mounted on the top of, uh, of any, any farming vehicle, like a tractor. Uh, the goal of the company is to significantly augment uh, the bottom line of, of the farmer through saving unnecessary uh, chemicals, nutrients and water uh, and ultimately protecting the environment along the way. Um, the company itself, we, we've, we've raised 3.2 million uh, uh, in funding so far from, uh, from American and European venture capitals. Uh, we are 23 people. Uh, uh, most of whom are based actually in Athens, Greece. Uh, we also have a small business development department in the Midwest, in the USA. Um, and this is a really interesting panel for me because most, most of, of you guys, uh, the panelists, like uh, you've helped me uh, personally uh, through, through this journey. So it's really special and uh, I'm really glad to be here. Great, thank you for that, George. And um, of course, as you mentioned, you're, 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 you, you, know, you grew up, you come from Greece. And uh, nowadays you are, uh, I think, uh, somewhere between Greece and U.S. I mean, COVID is making a little bit of an issue for you, but uh, you have one foot in the U.S. from what I understand and one, and one foot in Greece, trying yep. to raise money at the same time, uh, you know, uh, growing the company, right? Yes, exactly. So I come from uh, the dead center of Greece, uh, the biggest farmland in Greece. It's, it's the, the area of Thessaly over there. I come from a city called Volos. Uh, and, you know, my family uh, uh, was running a farm at the, uh, you know, uh, in the past, so that was my natural beginning for, for this company. And, and uh, currently, today, as you as you said, like I'm in between Kansas and and Athens, uh, trying to find farmers and, uh, and investors alike. Right. And with that, I would like to jump into the question or subject uh, for today for you, George. And um, this has to do with a very popular um, uh, subject, um, which is the dichotomy of profitability and protection of the environment. This is something that um, I would call it the anathema of classic agriculture and something that modern agriculture needs to address. So what are your views? What's your positioning? So this topic is uh, really close to my heart because it's, it's, uh, it's, it's one of the main problems that uh, actually Augmenta is, is trying to solve. Uh, and in my uh, honest opinion, it's one of the biggest problems uh, that humankind is facing. Uh, I may sound a, bit, a little bit dramatic, but uh, it, it's, it's, we are currently uh, 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 truly at, at a crossroad. On the one hand, you, you have the evident damage uh, that farming is doing to the environment, right? Like fertilizers, uh, 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 especially the excessive use of, of those are a big part of the greenhouse phenomenon, uh, the, the, the pollution of the underwater horizon uh, in a lot of places around the world, all the northern states in the United States, the, 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 uh, Greece, uh, the, the mid, uh, uh, the center of Europe like Germany and Hungary. So like it's, it's a huge problem. At the same time, you have uh, the fact that uh, is extraordinary, which is like 95% of pesticides do not actually reach their target. Um, and, and so much more. Uh, so so, so there's, there's, there's really no debate about, about uh, uh, the damage that, fertil uh, that, that agriculture is doing to the environment. But um, the problem is, is how are we trying to solve this, in my opinion? Like uh, today, if you really look at it, you, you'll see uh, the Green Deal coming from, from Europe. You'll see similar state, state uh, uh, regulations coming in, in, in uh, some of the states in the United States. Practically, we enforce farmers uh, and pretty radically and pretty uh, 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 fast to, to, to uh, reduce their usage of, of crop inputs, uh, like fertilizers, nutrients, and chemicals, um, like nutrients, chemicals, and water. Uh, but, but on the other hand, if you go and ask like any farmer, uh, even educated farmers, uh, they will tell you that, you know, if you force me to moderate uh, my crop inputs in the, f in, the, in the farm, this will hinder uh, my productivity, right? And, and you ask me at the same time to keep producing more food because, you know, by 2050, we will have 10 billion people in the world, right? So it's like, it's like a very clear and evident problem, um, which, which definitely needs a solution. Uh, uh, one big part of the problem is, is definitely cultural. So we need to uh, definitely educate uh, uh, the, the farmers that, you know, it's not uh, the correct way is not necessarily the way that your grandfather or grandmother uh, taught you. Um, this is easier said than done, to be honest. Maybe it, sound, it sounds like, uh, uh, even stupid to, to, to some to some outside people, but but it's 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 a real problem. Uh, so, so 
going back to the solution, I think that you know governments obviously play a huge role uh, because they go in between uh, the farmer and the consumer. Uh, governments have to uh, um, uh, incentivize farmers to to start using innovation. But uh, uh, interestingly enough, I think that the, the biggest uh, the, in the heart the, the heart of the solution will will will, will be innovation, uh, and I think that not not any innovation. So 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 that's my my only point here like it's not it's not good enough to create a cool solution it's not good enough to create something that will save some you know uh, pesticides from a small plot farm in california uh in my opinion you you have to be very pragmatic uh boots on the ground as i say often uh you need to create solutions that are sustainable for the farmer um sharing one of uh, our company values you, you you have to you have to create solutions that make farming more profitable uh, for the end customer, so that you see rapid uh, growth and, and rapid adoption of the technology, because only with rapid adoption you will actually see an, an impact. If you create a solution that is used by a, a handful of millionaire farmers in the Midwest, what is the actual impact uh, for the world, right? So um, that's my my you know takeaway from this. Like I think that we should we should be obsessive uh, uh, with with. Um, the, uh, the, the farming side, the, the farmer side, uh, we should be obsessive of, uh, with, uh, with creating solutions that, that really help uh, uh, the thousands, uh, uh, thousand acre farmers around the world. Uh, a, 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 and yeah, that, that, that are focused on, on, on return on investment and clear cut uh, uh, value add. And that's, where, and that's where, of course, Augmenta is, is striving with a precision solution, right? In order to make sure that uh, the farmer has uh, and all the field analysis, real-time view on what to do and how to better overcome the, um, you know, the issues of crop protection without uh, creating waste or off-site effects, right? Yeah, yeah. Augmenta was created uh, with a very simple, uh, you know, thinking. Uh, when we were driving the tractor, uh, I was actually doing my PhD at the time in embedded systems. So I was I was driving the tractor. I, I was talking to uh, to farmers in, in the village in the, the middle of Greece, and it was really evident that we we are not doing something right. Like we, it was really evident that we are over applying stuff, or at least we we are not putting many uh, much thought into applications. So uh, at the same time, we had a very powerful and expensive tool, which was the tractor, uh, and we were only using the tractor to pull and push things, right? Which, in my opinion, was uh, was. Uh, extremely inefficient um, uh, and, and stupid, especially because at the same time we were hiring, you know, drone pilots to come from uh, the city, right? Uh, come and fly these small things uh, uh, above your above our farm, uh, take some pictures, go back in the office, uh, process everything, and, and and get back to you with some, you know, numbers. Uh, this this, in my opinion, was extremely uh, um, uh, uh, inefficient. So we what we practically did is that we took the technology from my real imagery. We, we took the the, the camera-based uh, 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 scanning, uh, and we put it on the top of, of the tractor so that practically we do two things at once. We, we not only go in and, and do an, an our normal operation like fertilization, but we scan in the front, we, we understand what's going on in the field, uh, what's going on in every inch of the field, to be honest, to be uh, more specific, and then we apply the correct amount of, of uh, nutrients, chemical and water to the correct spot so that ultimately we have a different treatment for, for every inch of the farm. And, and this means less, uh, traditionally less uh, and significantly less uh, 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 chemicals and water and, and nutrients and we, with even or more productivity at the same time, which is, which is pretty robust in my opinion. Great. Thank you very much uh, for that, George. Um, I haven't seen any questions coming up during our discussion, but I'm sure something's gonna come up. So I will hold um, uh, any questions um, for, for, for you specifically uh, at the end. And then I would like to move to uh, the next speaker, the next uh, panelist, that's uh, Fotis Fotiadis. Um, Fotis, uh, if you could switch on your camera. Um, Fotis Fotiadis from Better Region. My camera is on, right? Hi, everyone. Now you're right. <laughs> so for this, welcome uh, to this forum. Um, uh, could you please start with a quick introduction about yourself and your company before we move on to the specific subject? Of course. First of all, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor to be in the part of the panel and a really, really interesting topic of conversation. Um, my name is Fotis. I'm an engineer by training and by practice. 
I, I used to be, I was working in the oil and gas industry before I went on to found Battery Origin. And uh, I moved out of Greece when I was around 18 to study abroad. And uh, now I'm looking to start doing interesting things back home. It's something we can talk about. And uh, at Better Origin, what we do is something very simple. We convert food waste uh, back into animal feed and food using insects. We've been going for about four years now uh, with a very uh, specific focus around technology and innovation. We've raised about 1 million in private funding and around 3 million, I'd say, in public funding. And uh, we're at a point now that's really exciting. We, we, we have solved the science problem. We have solved the technology problem. And we're about to, to scale uh, and uh, launch our product. Um, yeah. Very nice. So um, you are, are you currently based in, in Greece? I think you are in England, right, at the moment? Uh, yeah, we, we're based in Cambridge, in England. Right. Well, well, I'm based in Cambridge in the United States, so, you know. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So, um, right. So, um, here we want to discuss a little bit more um, the innovation with you, right? Innovation in connection to sustainability and in, in your case, you know, to waste management. And the, the second part of the, of the subject is innovation in connection to uh, flexible business opportunities for the ones mm. who adopt your technology. So mm. tell us a little bit more about it. Of course, I mean, sustainability is an extremely important topic. I think everyone is kind of finally recognizing that. It is existential threat, and it's something that has to be addressed on all fronts, starting from agriculture and technology all the way to finance, for example. And usually when you have a big problem, innovation is a great way to solve it. So solving sustainability through innovation is something that has to happen and has been happening. And uh, it was, it's been evident in what we're doing as well. For example, we started with a problem, that was food waste. And uh, to give you a bit of background, we started uh, by participating in a university organized competition at Cambridge University. And the main topic to solve was food waste. And we looked at all the different options available at the time. And, and it just didn't make sense why, for example, you would take uh, food and put it back to the soil, which is not very good at yield. And uh, as George said, we can touch upon profitability. It didn't make a lot of sense. Or you would almost like decompose the food and produce electricity. Where, and again, there are so many more efficient ways like solar panels, like wind to do that. And, uh, and then we look into some staggering numbers, which, for example, one third of all food produced every single year is wasted, yet, we have to increase food production by 70%. And if you look into, if you look into the food chain and the food system, this is, this is a, it's a crazy imbalance on how you have all these nutrients trapped into waste. But then yet again, you need all these nutrients to go back to food production. And then to solve this problem, we looked back into nature. And the interesting thing is that if you look into nature, the concept of waste doesn't really exist. Because when something biodegrades or decomposes, it either gets absorbed by the soil, which is composting, or insects show up and they convert those wasted nutrients back into fats and proteins that are essential amino acids for animals and humans. So we thought, isn't that elegant and cool? And, and what we're doing at Better Origin basically is taking that natural concept, putting it together with cutting edge technology and trying to modernize it. Because again, if you go back to the food chain, insects is almost like the missing link between food waste and feed. And uh, technology innovation is what enables it to make it relevant in this day and age. Right, right. Yeah, no, no, no doubt. And um, <clears throat> that's very interesting how you have approached it um, and bring the full fledged connection to sustainability. Uh, now, what about the, the business angle, the, mm -hmm. the, the opportunities that you can provide to those uh, connected to your technology? Of course, of course. And uh, on this topic, I could not agree more with George. Uh, it's, we took exactly the same approach. And uh, if you look into the, our sector right now, the insect bioconversion sector, it's quite young. It's about 10 years old, max, but has been gaining a lot of momentum. And uh, most, most uh, standard solutions out there right now involve mega factories, right? They're very expensive. They cost 30 to 50 million uh, pounds or dollars to run and operate and, and scale. And um, if, you, if you look into insect bioconversion, in its core, it's farming. And for us, it made no sense whatsoever why a farmer would have to put up 20 million to do this process. It's hard to scale, it's very hard to operate. And if you look into farming, it's very decentralized, right? It is, a lot of it is on site. And most of these people have the specific, the same expertise in farming that they can operate this, uh, this, this process. So instead of going and building a very expensive factory that is hard to scale, we've gone completely the other way. 
and we tried to productize this concept, right? So we have, um, we have designed, manufactured and deployed now a fully autonomous insect mini farm. It is in a shipping container. It is very easy to transport. It's a plug and play system. We, we had a lot of workshops when we we're designing this with farmers, because as George mentioned, we want to make sure that what we design and build is with the farmer at the core. And um, the shipping container means that, again, we can mass manufacture it in one location. We can install it anywhere, whether that is mud, gravel, cement, wherever it is, next to the, next to the farm. And on site, we can convert waste to insects. And obviously this is really important because we empower, we allow all these farmers out there who have the same expertise, who want to diversify their portfolios, want to make more money to be able to have a tool that makes insect processing accessible. And um, that was the first step of enabling the farmer to do the farming. And the second step in our scale up, we have semi-centralized hubs that we can take, we can buy back the full grown uh, insect from the farmer and process that into different nutrients and different products, whether that is, for example, pet feed, human food, salmon feed, depending on the industry and depending on the focus. Um, and again, to be able to enable that, a solution that can be operated on site, decentralized by farmer, there was a lot of need for innovation. And a core part of the innovation is computer vision, machine learning, because you can imagine, right, if we go to a farmer with this idea of we're going to install a small insect factory in your farm, A, you can't expect him to be an expert in growing insects. So that all is happening by us remotely, using computer vision, machine learning. And B, you gotta make sure that you can monitor the whole thing remotely. You don't wanna be sending guys in and out every day to fix things. So two elements went into the design of our system. One was, can we make it cheap and robust? So farmers can make it accessible. And the second thing is remote operation, remote monitoring, so that we don't require from the user or the farmer to become an expert in that. What is really fascinating to, to me, Sotiris, is that um, not only you touched on the angle of sustainability um, overall, but you, know, you focus for something that is of particular importance for the smallholder farmer. And we have many smallholder farmers in Greece that um, usually you know, they struggle to make a living. And um, you know, when, when something like um, you know, out of uh, a natural disaster happens, then of course they are in deep debts. So with this approach, you give them the opportunity to make more income, but at the same time, you contribute to an overall change, like a paradigm shift, because as we all know at the moment, a basic part of our uh, protein comes from, from animals, right? And mainly from cow. And not many people realize that uh, there's a much more efficacious way of producing protein, and this is from insects. So essentially, you contribute, you contribute to, a, to a global shift that is just taking place just starting to take in place. And with this, you give the opportunity, as you said, not to go into mega factories, which now under COVID, most of the supply chains uh, have proven to, to show that, you know, this is not the best way forward, but uh, also, you know, connect all these small holder farmers, uh, not only to make something profitable, but to contribute to the overall change uh, in protein production. So Totally, totally. So I'm very happy to, to have you here. Um, um, I, I have one question. Um, that just came in, so I would like to take it. Uh, the question is, uh, what insects do you use? Uh, multiple species, and how about bacteria? Of course. Um, the insect we use right now to farm is called the black soldier fly, and it's very efficient for this exact reason. It's very good at taking wet feedstocks, like food surplus or food waste, and over just less than two weeks, between 11 and 14 days, it multiplies 5,000 times its body mass and converts those nutrients into fats and proteins. So it's really good for this application. So our farming units, these, the, the containers process that. However, our technology, we treat it as a platform and we have processed millworms, we have processed crickets and black soldier flies. And as we enter this really exciting sector, and as you mentioned, it's gonna be growing and growing for the, over the next years because the need for alternative proteins is gonna be increasing as we approach 10 billion people on this planet. And um, we're looking to use our technologies to be able to process other species as well. Great, great. So thank you very much um, for that, Fotis. I think uh, we've all learned a lot about this very interesting uh, uh, subject and um, uh, I wish you all the best uh, going forward. Um, I would like now to switch to our um, uh, next um, uh, speaker, uh, Sotiris Bantas.
Sotiri? Hi. Hi. Hi, Apostolos. So, um, hi, welcome to this event. Um, without any further ado, I would like to give you the opportunity to uh, introduce a little bit uh, yourself sure. and your company, Centaur. Um, we're talking about uh, a different uh, from the others um, approach here. Uh, you're moving into a post-harvest uh, disease management or um, disease overall um, uh, view, and uh, it has its, its own links to, uh, to sustainability. But before jumping into the topic, um, uh, please let us understand a little bit more about your background. Sure, sure. Um, first of all, it's a big pleasure to be here, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's such great company. Um, so I'm Sudiris uh, Bantas, I'm uh, co-founder and CEO of uh, Centaur. Uh, Center is developing the Internet of Crops. So this is a full stack IoT platform which is leveraging smart wireless sensors and data analytics, which is a cognitive um, technology to essentially power <laughs> abundance and waste reduction in the ag supply chain. In a way, you can think of us standing in the way between the farm and uh, Fortis' inputs, unfortunately because we're trying to sort of reduce the amount of product that's harvested, uh, stored, and uh, spoils, uh, so it doesn't make its way to the end consumer. Uh, we're really focused on grains and cereals, uh, and the farm to food processor segments of the supply chain, which also includes uh, things like grain logistics and so on. But we're also supporting other crops like coffee, uh, nuts, and so on. So, uh, a few words about uh, myself and the background, uh, which led me to co-found uh, Centaur, which uh, uh, you may find interesting. First of all, uh, similarly to George before me, I'm also, I'm a, I'm a bit older than him, uh, but I'm also a product of, uh, of Thessaly, uh, which is interesting, uh, planes and a more interesting coastline, I guess. Uh, uh, we decided, and I decided with my co-founders to base this company out of Volus, uh, which ended up becoming a very interesting platform for what we ended up building uh, based on it being, uh, besides being my hometown and the place I grew up in, it has a, a, an interesting university with faculties such as the School of Agriculture and uh, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, which we're drawing very heavily from, but is also very well situated with uh, you know, a lot of agriculture in the area a lot of food processing along the lines of grain mills and pasta factories and so on. So we have a very interesting platform, a very interesting uh, playground to, if you may, to try out solutions, but also uh, ground truth our solutions and ensure uh, that the technology we, we produce, which is pretty cutting edge, uh, makes its way to uh, the farm and makes its way to recouping farmer income, but also finds uses in, 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 in the industry in food processors and so on and so forth. So we couldn't have thought of a better place to start a company like this. Uh, and it's really paying off. Currently, of course, our technology, the things that we build like this uh, little sensor here uh, is exported from Volus to more than 25 countries. Uh, our data, our sensors are blipping from, from uh, different locations, uh, passing inputs to our data analysis and providing insights to farmers, quality control people in food factories, uh, logistics providers, helping them uh, fight the root causes of waste and helping them, more importantly, market their products at the best possible price and at the best possible quality. Right, and, and on that, I just wanted to um, dig a little bit more deeper. I mean, uh, as I said before, for me, this is a, a post-harvest disease management, which uh, has been the core of many agricultural companies however, with little success so far. Um, what is the challenges uh, that you face managing uh, the food chain requirements, starting from the farmer to the supermarkets, uh, to consumers? It's like it's becoming, especially in, in Europe at the moment, in European Union, a hot topic because of the residues. So um, where do you see this going and how do you, with your technology, can contribute? Sure. Uh, I think there are several facets of this uh, that are there. And I think even COVID-19 has, has brought some, some additional uh, considerations and concerns, including our inability or lack of ability to frequently sample products for, or do the quality control routines that were available to us in the past or before COVID. So for instance, now if 
grain sitting in an elevator in, in a silo starts spoiling and creates a food safety liability, uh, there's you know for less frequent inspections from uh, from uh, people usually tasked with this sort of thing to discover it early on. So that's where technology uh, can provide solutions that are timely and very important for the integrity of our supply chain going forward. Now, from a consumer standpoint, obviously uh, there's there's a growing awareness and uh, I would say push from consumers and retailers are really reacting on that to uh, understand the provenance and quality of food in a much deeper and better way. So everybody is well versed in using a smartphone for scanning a QR code or whatever other signage on a product and unraveling the data story behind it. So when it comes to food, that essentially means where food came from, how it was processed, if uh, sustainable practices were employed for growing it and so on and so forth. So that's a big thing. And we like to think that Centro is providing a very important link for that in the sense that uh, we enable sustainable practices, we enable waste mitigation. We also have certain use cases for managing and reducing the use of chemicals in the post-harvest stages of crop management and protection. And all that uh, inures to the benefit of the consumer who want to have clean, safe to consume foods uh, with a certain story that comes with them. And we also solve for the provenance in, in certain unique ways, like enabling our, our stakeholders, currently uh, buyers of commodities and processors like flour mills and so on, to track where product has uh, been stored and how product is being transported down the supply chain. Eventually, this is information that can be accessed by consumers in a transparent supply chain. So there is there's a big push. And if you're a consumer, everybody's a consumer of food, do push your brand, the brands that you trust to enable more transparency because the technology is there. Uh, it's just that those companies need even more motivation for making it happen and having that data um, made available to consumers in, in a more transparent manner. Right. Thank you about that, Sotiris. And I think here we, we conclude the, the discussion with, um, with all of you, the, the, the three speakers. Um, I would like just to say um, a few words and then we jump into an open Q&A. Um, I mean, uh, first of all, I'm happy to hear both from you and from George. You know, you come from, from Thessaly. I have, uh, during my time in Bayer, over the, from 2014 until 2019, I was in Bayer as a general manager in Greece. And together with Alexis Kouyas, we tried from football to everything that has to do in agriculture to push that, uh, that region of Greece, um, <clears throat> which is uh, a, a centerpiece of agriculture and I would say also of innovation. And um, um, I have been now working for uh, approximately 15 years in the two biggest uh, companies, Bayer and Syngenta, uh, which, do, which do come with lots of approaches, but... Uh, um, having said that with traditional approaches and I see I'm very uh, you know excited to see this uh, innovation that is coming from 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 these startups uh, especially the ones uh, from Greece um, that's the one point the other point is that uh, during my position over a bit more than a year in, in flaxi pioneering um, it's uh, it's been um, quite an insight um, to see you know what what um, agriculture can offer and how you can bridge uh, things from healthcare and bring them to agriculture in a, in a much easier and, uh, you know, uh, efficacious way. Uh, because although we struggle with lots of uh, issues in agriculture, I mean, it is, um, it is a segment that essentially uh, there's not much, uh, there's not much uh, research that has taken place. There's not much investment that has taken place for, for R&D over the years, apart from the, the classic uh, small molecules production from the bigger companies. So um, I will be following up um, your developments and in any way or form, um, I will be um, there to, to try to, um, you know, to be the open mind uh, person to help, uh, you know, connect the dots between your aspirations and what can be achieved, especially through the, uh, the culture, the United States culture here, where, you know, uh, lots of venture capital funds are open to invest. Um, let us uh, now switch to a um, couple of the questions that I can see uh, from the Q&A. I mean, one, one first one came a little bit earlier was, uh, 
uh, from Manos here addressing um, um, the density production in Greece where um, it says that uh, it is 10 times lower than the one in Holland or Israel, but yet the per unit uh, of ag production and the use of fertilizer pesticides is about the same. So why is this and how can we address this issue? Um, who would like to answer this? Uh, I'm not in a position to answer it. I'm not in the Ministry of uh, Agriculture. What, what I can say is that the, the reason why we are trying, as, as I said before, to link much more effectively scientific research uh, with agriculture has to do exactly with, with those figures. And I think that these two countries, Israel and the Netherlands, are, are two extremely good examples to compare with Greece because uh, they have, in terms of population, uh, we have similar numbers. Uh, they have less area uh, to, to cultivate, but they, they have much more production. So it is obvious in, in terms of competition that they are doing something in a better way than we are doing. That doesn't have to do with the quality of the products, but with the process, uh, the technology perhaps they use, uh, and the fact that they uh, have... Uh, uh, convince the, the, the farmers to, to use innovative methods. So linking it also to the other question that was uh, put in the, in the, in the Q&A session, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to convince uh, uh, an older aged farmer to, to use new technology and different ways from what they have been taught in the past. I, I, I don't want to say, and I don't, I, I don't want to sound uh, racist in terms of age, but when, when you have been taught uh, by your parents and even perhaps your grandparents uh, about a specific way you use in order to cultivate, it is for everybody difficult to, to change it. Now, uh, although it's not a, a, an age issue, there are uh, more and more examples of, uh, of farmers in the country, throughout the, uh, the country, that are starting to, to use more innovative ways. Of course, it would be much more useful if, if uh, we, could, uh, we could teach our farmers about uh, the, the new methods in, in, uh, in, certain, uh, uh, in certain fields, about uh, how you can take advantage of, of new technology uh, in, uh, in uh, cultivating uh, products. Um, and one issue that uh, I have met, not as a deputy minister, but as a member of parliament, is the fact that um, there is a trust, there is a, 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 a lack of trust between many farmers. So one, one of the problems has to do with the fact that we have many small farmers in Greece, which could be an advantage under circumstances if they unite their forces uh, and, and have... Uh, uh, um, uh, working working groups that that have uh, common common uh, uh, strategies. So, but this this is not the case. You, you see that most most of the farmers um, do not want to unite their forces with other farmers, even in the same region, uh, mostly due to reasons of trust. When you when you have less uh, quantity. Uh, of products to sell, it's much more difficult to, to, to sell uh, outside the country. Uh, if though, in, in cases that I have observed, where farmers start using uh, innovative methods in their, uh, uh, in their fields, and um, perhaps in the beginning there is, there is some distrust by uh, some of the other farmers, but when they see that this leads to more profits, uh, they start asking questions and want to know more and more. Uh, and I think that will be the more, most effective way in order to, to convince a big part of our, of our farmers to uh, use innovation and, and technology uh, more effectively in, in the country. Yes, Th thank you for that, Christos. I think I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. And I think uh, your initiative uh, will create awareness for all this um, uh, new uh, startups and of course technologies that are coming out um, some of them of course coming from Greece 
um, which, uh, which is, uh, of course, uh, an honor and a, and a pleasure to have all these uh, individuals. Uh, and at the same time, we could, we could help each other because I think, uh, in my experience at least, it has to be an open and continuous discussions with, with the farmers so that we can take their feedback and uh, they feel, you know, they can, they can start trusting uh, something which is out of uh, the norm for them. I mean, I do have the experience of my father. He's, uh, he's, a, he's an agronomist. He's been uh, in agriculture for all his life. But uh, even as a general manager of a big agricultural company, I couldn't change his mind sometimes. So it's been, uh, it's been uh, you know, a, an experience for me to see, you know, how things that the farmers learn are so difficult to change. Um, even if, if you do have, as I said, the opportunity to, you know, to be even within the family. So um, with that, I would say this is an important point and we need to focus as much as possible. Um, now, I'm aware we have uh, three more minutes um, until the end of the session, and I don't, I don't want to make any, uh, uh, any further I think, um, openings for any other questions. We do have many questions, and I would like to distribute this back uh, to... Um, to the um, uh, speakers and the panelists to, to try to address them. Um, but uh, at this point in time, I think we're short of time. So um, I would like to take- Can, a can, I, can I jump in, Apostle, just to say one word? Like, why don't we, why don't we uh, take uh, a page out of US Playbook and, and, and start creating some extension services, right? I mean, what we are discussing right now is this gap between innovation and farming. And uh, two questions address that. I mean, if we, if we really do this, uh, not only through the universities, but, but, uh, but also through, um, you know, the, uh, the municipalities, uh, you can do it through uh, the uh, nonprofits, uh, where their, their main job would be to connect the innovation with farmers through, you know, incentivizing, uh, uh, educating farmers. So I think, I think we, we are quite behind on that. And, and given the fact that we are, our uh, agricultural engineering is so strong, I think we are missing out uh, on that. No doubt, and I think this is a, this is a very good proposal, and should try to uh, to approach it that way also. Um, yes, but um, problem again is that time is up, so um, I have a hard stop. Unfortunately, I would like to take the opportunity and thank everyone um, for this uh, very fascinating uh, webinar and forum, and um, we will have the opportunity to have a follow up on this and and exchange more, and I will make sure that we can address uh, your questions. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thank you for being with us and uh, looking forward to see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Nice. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye bye.